In 2019, Walmart bought a whole bunch of floor cleaning robots. I don't really know the business details, but one of them ended up at my local store, and the first time I saw it... Bro. Bro, no way. So one thing led to another, and I asked the store manager if I could stick my camera on it. And unbelievably, he said yes. This video started as an April Fool's joke where I was going to do what I usually do on this channel, which is observe an autonomous taxi and narrate over top of it. Except it's haha funny April Fool's because it's a mop robot instead of a car, but then I got curious. So I did some research and it turned out to be pretty interesting. So my actual goal with this video now is to show you what it is, how it works, and overall kind of explain this robot that to me, represents yet yeah, another step in the mass adoption of automation technologies in the real world, whether they be flashy or potentially mundane. Beat up the mop. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so this is the Tenant T7 AMR powered by Brain OS. All right, so what does that actually mean? Very briefly, Tenant is a company that makes floor cleaning equipment, and Brain Corporation makes Brain OS, which they describe as the leading autonomy platform driving robotic and AI applications at scale, empowering organizations to automate and infuse intelligence into core operations. Basically, they make the software. Together, they created the T7 AMR, which is the robot that Walmart, in the USA at least, bought a ton of. I actually reached out to both of them for an interview so they could help me fact check this video and, you know, maybe give them the opportunity to control the narrative a bit. Uh, they were both initially interested and then they disappeared. So I'm kind of on my own and it's too bad for you guys because now I can say whatever I want. In a sense, this scrubber is kind of just the fancy version of a basic line following robot. What do I mean by that? Well, when it's cleaning, it's not being remote controlled by a human at a desk, like the Tesla Robo Taxi. It's not acting like an old Roomba, you know, bouncing randomly all over the store. And it's not even using super intelligent AI to forge its own path. When the scrubber is originally set up, a human drives it along a route, which it then learns. Now, the first question you might have is, if it's just playing back a recorded route, doesn't that mean you have to start it in exactly the same place every time or it'll start crashing into everything? Well, yes, but actually no. Like you may have noticed, this robot has some fancy sensors on the front. And as it turns out, when you're teaching a route, the robot is using those to map out its surroundings and place itself in that map. If you're interested in more technical details, here's your search phrase. This means that when it's cleaning, it can find the original path that you drove and stick to it, but it can also deviate to avoid obstacles. Like, watch what it does here when I stand in front of it. Nice. Bonus fun fact. This little code you might sometimes see in a Walmart is called a home marker. What does it do? Well, when the robot is done charging and it's ready to clean, you can't just unplug it from the wall and tell it to go follow the route. As you might expect, it does need a known starting point. So these home markers are spread out throughout the store and they act as those points. When you're ready to clean, you drive out to a home marker and the robot uses one of its 2D cameras, specifically the one on the right side, to recognize the marker and then presents you with the options for which remembered route it should drive. Documentation mentions that if the home marker is moved even slightly, the route may not be performed correctly. I'm not sure if that gives us any hints as to how the robot actually positions itself in 3D space, but it is interesting. Speaking of cameras, let's talk about those sensors. 
How does this robot really see the world? I mentioned the 2D cameras. There's one on the front here and one to either side. And as well as finding the home markers, they can also take photos of any obstacles that the robot can't figure out how to pass and send them off to a human for review. Just below that front 2D camera is an entirely different type of camera called the time of flight camera. Rather than seeing regular colors, the pixels captured in the image from time of flight cameras represent depth information, which can be used to generate a 3D reconstruction of the scene. I went down a light research rabbit hole trying to comprehend how this truly works on a more technical level, you know, like the physics and optics and algorithms. Well, it turns out that the details, while super fascinating, are actually insane, and I don't doubt that many people have spent their lives and careers researching this topic. Suffice it to say, for the purposes of this video, a sensor based on the time of flight principle can, broadly speaking, work in one of two ways direct or indirect time of flight. Direct is when a sensor sends out a laser pulse of light and measures the amount of time that it takes to reflect back. Using the known speed of light in air, it can calculate the distance with pretty good accuracy. It's common for these sensors to use infrared or near-infrared light that human eyes can't see. On the other hand, an indirect sensor sends out a continuous high-frequency flood of light, or multiple with different frequencies, but don't worry about it, then measures the phase difference of the incoming reflection. It gets really weird with the math and each type of sensor has its own pros and cons and is used in different situations. But at the end of the day, a time of flight sensor is measuring distance using light. It could be measuring just a single point like in this animation or maybe 64 points like the eight x eight resolution direct sensor that my phone's cameras use for autofocus. Or the direct flash LiDAR on an iPhone with a couple hundred points. Or even the floodlit indirect sensor on a mopping robot with over 22,000 points. Or even literally millions of points, tens of times per second, like on the Waymo self-driving cars. Hey look, that's me! Now some of you might be saying, hey, what about Face ID? You're on the right track, but as it turns out, Face ID on an iPhone is infrared points of light, but it's not actually time of flight. There's a lot to discuss when it comes to how Face ID works, but this is a video about a mop robot, and I've already been rambling about time of flight for the last two minutes. So if you're interested in more details, I recommend you check out some official Apple documentation I linked down below, or this amazing video. So back to the robot. The mop robot has a total of three 3D cameras. One on the front, like we mentioned, and two shorter range cameras, one to either side pointing down here and here. There's no official confirmation, like I mentioned earlier, but if I were to guess, I'd say that the front one is for finding people or other large obstacles, while the side ones keep an eye out for anything that could be blocking the turning path. Say, if I was walking next to the robot, it wouldn't turn onto my foot. Well, that's great, you say, but what if the robot is uh, about to drive off a giant cliff? Or more realistically, an escalator, though the operating instructions do explicitly tell you to avoid that. Well, hey, no worries, we've got that covered. Because this is the TIM551. It's a 2D LiDAR scanner from SIC. Y yes, that is actually their name. I don't know, man, it's German that uses a single laser beam and a little rotating mirror, and yet somehow it still manages to cost more than two of my paychecks. Alright, obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the T7 AMR has two of them. One here at the top, angled down, and the other hiding down below, you know, 10 centimeters or 4 inches off the ground. According to official docs, the TIM551 has a field of view of 270 degrees, a typical range of about 8 meters, and the scanner spins at 15 times a second. What does it actually see? Well, a flat circular plane of distance measurements, or a slice of 3D space, hence the 2D in the name. Wait, so it's using light to measure distance? Why yes, it is a time of flight sensor, direct to be precise. But wait, right here it says it's a LiDAR sensor. Also yes. The key difference? Direction. Knowing both the direction and the distance for a whole bunch of measurements, then putting those together, is what's called a point cloud. And that's what makes a LiDAR sensor. 
here's a pretty neat visual of the Tim 551's actual output, courtesy of BrainCorp. Hey, thanks guys. Click Diagnostics and Raw Planar LiDAR. The tube on the left is seen by the sensor and is displayed on the screen as a crescent array of white dots. Note that the white dots move out of the screen as the tube is removed from the sensor view. A forklift is parked to the forward left of the robot. No white dots appear on the screen that correspond to the forks. The sensor does see the technician maneuver around the left and in front of the machine, but the forks remain undetected by the lower LiDAR sensor. Machine forks and even carpet can all fall below the 10 centimeter threshold thereby remaining unseen by the lower sensor. It is important to understand the environment the robot navigates, so these sorts of obstacles may be cleared before initiating autonomy. So how does any of that help us not drive off a cliff? Again, no official confirmation, but here's my guess. The downward angle of the sensor gives us a view that intersects with the ground at a known constant distance. If that measurement suddenly changes, say either increasing or decreasing, we could infer that it might not be safe to proceed, or we just have a turn coming up. And that's all the sensors. Overall, I think they give the robot a pretty neat perspective of the world, and I hope you enjoyed learning about them as much as I did. I didn't even know that indirect time of flight cameras existed before this, and for any Waymanauts in the audience, I think I finally understand what this is. Well, you guys are so secretive that you'll never confirm it, so oh well. But maybe your biggest takeaway from this video could be that the scrubber can't see behind itself. So feel free to remember that for the robot uprising. <laughs> if you're ready, you know, run those two routes without interruption. Alrighty. You, you get it where you want it. Yeah, I'm just gonna... Not too picky, you know. So, how are these robots faring out in the real world? In 2023, BrainCorp claimed some pretty crazy numbers for their cleaning stats. Meanwhile, overall employee and public sentiment sits somewhere between tepid and delighted, or at least amused. What really struck me while researching this robot is how refreshingly repairable it is. Every part is readily available for purchase. Every maintenance or operations manual, every video tutorial or other resource, it's all publicly available. Many repairs on this robot boil down to unscrew the thing, unplug it, and swap in a new one. I've been immersed in the world of consumer electronics where gadgets are made to be disposable. Maybe this is oversimplifying it a bit, but the attitude is, you know, one solder joint breaks on your $2,000 laptop? Too bad, throw out the whole thing and get a new one. There are people working to fix that, but there's still a ways to go. In a world where much official repair documentation is hidden behind paywalls, looking at you car companies, I have to say it, Tenant and BrainCorp set a high bar that every manufacturer should strive to meet. I've never really explored it, so maybe this is just the expectation in the high-end industrial equipment market, especially when a new one of these costs 20 times what I bought my car for, which is frankly insane, but I still think it's neat. Anyway, thank you so much for watching to the end. It's my first time doing an explainer video like this, so definitely let me know if you enjoyed or if you have any feedback. This is JJ Ricks, signing off. <laughs>